we could say it's a very exciting dramatic scene if we were in the middle of a something like a sports match then we would say that the sports match is about to begin and it's a war it's interesting that in this war the overall spirits are high so we first chapter has 46 texts and we are come to the 13th text now so in the 14th text the focus of the narrative camera the narrative lens comes to the side of the pandavas and among them it starts with two characters here it's interesting the contrast between duryodhan duryodhan's vision and the narrator's vision that is the character sanjay who is narrating this to um, duryodhan's vision and the narrator's vision duryodhan completely overlooked krishna he didn't even mention krishna at all whereas the sanjay begins with krishna so this verse is saying that on the other side on a beautiful a majestic chariot here a majestic chariot with white horses there are two people madava pandava so now one of the characteristics of older civilization in general and especially of the indian civilization is that each character has many names mm-hmm. and at different time the same character is referred to by different names and sometimes the commentators here go into uh, why this particular name is used for this character at that particular point so we won't go too much into that but here the gita sometimes it's easy to forget that it is a poetic book and the two names used for the two characters are rhyming madhava and pandava so madhava is the name of krishna and pandava is here referring to arjuna now and pandava there are five brothers on their side so all five you are the could be referred to as pandavas because pandava basically rep means son of pandu pandu was their father so pandavas in plural is the sons and pandava one is one of the sons so which is the son that is implicit because if somebody has known the mahabharat then they will know with krishna is going to be arjuna actually mm, this is one challenge with poetry the poetry is actually very difficult to translate it's almost non translatable mm-hmm. because we could translate text we could translate words you could find the equivalent meanings of words from here to there and put those words that's all fair enough but when it comes to poetry there's so much more going on over there and uh, the finding the exact equivalent words finding the denotations and the alliterations and all those poetic ornaments so that's quite difficult to figure out but i i'm also familiar with the sanskrit that's why if when we are talking i was talking about from that perspective but it's a it's a, it's a good reminder that this is it's called the song of god so it's more like a philosophy through poetry or through a poetic it's philosophical wisdom through a poetic composition so there are some poetic properties but anyway without going too much into that what is happening is these two characters are there and we had discussed how he mentioned karna even when karna was not present over there and he failed right. to mention krishna even when krishna was present right there you know that, that is, this is a plus universal fact of psychology we don't see things as they are we see things as we think they matter to us so our right. vision things as they are they may be there but we the way seeing the things as they matter to us but 
as we think they matter to us. It is that. So how we see things. It's, that's vision over here. Vision could mean many things. So for Duryodhan, Krishna doesn't seem to matter at all. But in the big picture, Krishna is going to matter a lot. And that's why this text is beginning with Krishna himself. And now, go, if you go back to that theme that, okay, is the place going to have some influence? It seems to be that there are many positive omens, positive signs for the Pandava side. And we'll come to that one by one. But one of them here is the word Madhava. Madhava, it literally means the Lord of Fortune. The one on whose side there is fortune. So it's a bit more poetic. This consider fortune is often considered to be a goddess and lord of the goddess of fortune. But we could put it simply. So this indicates that hey, that is a powerful side. So, so and then it is described that what are they doing? The view Shankha Pradatma. They also blow their conscious. So basically, here there is no talking right now. The talking was on the other side. Both of them, Krishna and Arjuna, they both blow their conscious. So it's interesting here that generally it is the warriors that blow the conscious. The charioteers don't usually blow the conscious. Subsequently, in the subsequent list that will be given of who all blow the conscious, it's a list of the warriors mentioned. The charioteers are not mentioned. So although Krishna is in one sense, a he is a charioteer over here. You know, he is not an ordinary charioteer. That he has, he, Krishna as the charioteer, it is not as a profession. There's no profession. There is no compulsion. It is not that there was a gun at his head and you have to be my charioteer. It is simply out of affection. That before this war began, now, if you go a little bit into the history, Krishna, we'll talk about Krishna's position a little later, but Krishna is the divine descended to the world. And he is descended, descended in a particular dynasty. So both these people, if you could say the Pandavas and the Kauravas, they are both in the same dynasty. Hmm. They are in one dynasty. And then there is, and Krishna has appeared in another dynasty. I won't go into the names of the dynasty so much over here. But here Krishna has appeared. And this dynasty is related. They have relationship with both sides. So, in those times, often the relations between were established through marriages. And marriages between different royal families would happen so that there would be a military alliances also. So they were related on both sides. So Krishna said that before the war, when both sides approached him to seek his help, Krishna said that, no, I, Krishna had a brother, Balram, he just stayed out. He said, I'm going to be neutral. Krishna said, you know, this war is too important. I won't stay out, but he said, I will I will offer my army on one side and I will be there on the other side. I won't be using any arms. So when Duryodhan from the Pandava side had Kaurava side had gone, he thought, oh, what is the use of one person as compared to an army of thousands and thousands of people? And that person is also saying, I'm not going to fight. So what's the use? So he was bursting with eagerness to choose. But Krishna tried to... The Krishna just curbed his enthusiasm. He said that, wait a minute, both of you come for my help. But you know, I saw Arjuna first. So what had happened was, Krishna, you could say, had been lying down. It's too long. Mm -hmm. 
So <laughs> Krishna had been lying down on bed. <laughs> and then Duryodhan came and just stood, he stood at his head. And Arjuna stood at his feet. Now standing at the feet is a sign of humility. So when Krishna got up, he saw Arjuna first. And Duryodhan said, I was here first. I should have the right to choose. Krishna said, okay. So I saw Arjuna first. Anyway, Arjuna is younger to you. Let him choose. Duryodhan was gritting his teeth. No. And then Arjuna said, Krishna, I choose you. And Duryodhan said, what a fool. What a loser. No intelligence at all. But externally, oh, okay. And I'll have to settle for the army. Just put on a facade and he came back. But here when Arjuna chose Krishna, Arjuna chose Krishna primarily because he knew that Krishna is the source of wisdom, the source of power. He's the source of fortune. Arjuna preferred that personal connection that over material prowess. And at that time, when Arjuna made that choice, he also requested Krishna that, can you be my charioteer? So now, when Arjuna made this request to Krishna to be a charioteer, this request to be a charioteer, it could have been seen as a sign of disrespect. Uh, he's, he's a formidable emperor, a formidable king. He is not only a king, he's like a king maker. He is very powerful. You are asking him to be a charioteer. But Arjuna and Krishna had a very affectionate relationship. And Krishna had been a charioteer for Arjuna also. So this request, that he, so there are two things, you know, he, he chose Krishna because of his affection. He loved Krishna. He had trust in Krishna's power. He had that vision to understand Krishna's position. He says, Krishna, even without weapons, even if he does not fight, his wisdom is huge and his insights will be huge. And then he asked him to be the charioteer because they were already a team. He wanted to be with Krishna. A warrior cannot just have time with other warriors constantly. But he asked him to be chariot out of his friendship. I want to be with you constantly, even in the war. And also because Krishna was an expert charioteer. Krishna, of course, was expert in many things. But the point is that here, the Gita introduces God, Krishna, in a disarmingly humble position. That he, where is he? His God uh, is not high up in the sky, reigning in the heavens. This is not to minimize any other tradition, but see if you consider the biblical tradition, in the beginning was the word and the word, the word was God. So, so the idea is God is existing high up or majestically. And yes, there are some mysterious mystical revelations. Generally, the general conception of God high up in the sky, almighty. But here, the idea of God is such an endearing vision of divinity that God, if normal idea is that we humans are here, and God is way up here somewhere, high up. But here, in one sense, you could say, in the chariot's position, the human is above and God is below. So, this is the human is Arjuna, and the divine here is Krishna. So, this is a very, this is a very endearing, bewildered, puzzling, intriguing, whatever word you want to use intriguing way of uh, position that Krishna has and uh, in a movie often, you know, how the main star comes, often people put a lot of thought into that. Maybe it's a warrior, the warrior comes charging in to save a damsel in distress or to beat up some thugs. It's generally, it's a dramatic entry and especially if it's a theater release movie, you know, people cheer and, ex and they explode with joy when they see the hero. So here the hero's entry in the Mahabharat is described in the most unexpected way. Yeah, he's, there's a magnificent chariot and he's there on the chariot. But he is the chauffeur. He's not the warrior. Hey, what's going on? So it's a very fascinating way of introducing 
uh, the main character the song of god but god's introduction is in a disarming humbly disarmingly humble way in a disarmingly humble position or unassuming position we can see just do a quick recap we just focus on one verse today the 14th word text and discussed three main points the first was that how the narrative lens is focusing on krishna and that indicates that the narrator sanjay's vision is different from duryodhan's vision duryodhan completely overlooked whereas sanjay didn't sanjay when you looked at first and foremost at him and the second we discuss the history of how krishna and arjuna were together krishna and arjuna together in the distinct position that krishna is the charioteer and third is we talked about the intro to the central character to god is so disarming over here hmm he comes in a such a intriguing position as not the supreme being but as subordinate to a human being out of affection so we'll continue in our next session